remain standing until the conclusion of the reading of the proclamation. Ladies and gentlemen, the proclamation. All persons having any business before this honorable court, now draw nigh, give your attendance, and you shall be heard. God save the Queen. Chief Justice, I have the honour to announce that I've been appointed a judge of this court. I present to you my commission. Thank you, Justice Chen. Please be seated while the commission is read. Principal Registrar, could you please read the commission? By the Honourable Chief Justice Andrew Scott Bell, Administrator of the State of New South Wales in the Commonwealth of Australia, to Nicholas Edward Chen, Barrister at Law, greeting. Whereas by the Supreme Court Act 1970, it is enacted that the Governor may, by commission under the public seal of the state, appoint any qualified person to be a judge of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Now I, the Honourable Chief Justice Andrew Scott Bell, Administrator of the State of New South Wales, in pursuance of the power and authority vested in me in that behalf, do, with the advice of the Executive Council of New South Wales, hereby appoint you, the said Nicholas Edward Chen, being a person qualified to be so appointed, to be a judge of the said court on and from the 11th day of July, 2022, with rank and precedence as such in the said court and in the aforesaid state, next after the Honorable Justice Dina Yechia, one of the judges thereof, provided always that you shall, except in case of leave of absence duly granted to you, actually execute the office to which you are by this commission appointed given under my hand and the public seal of the said state, this 22nd day of June, 2022, signed Andrew Scott Bell, Administrator, and by his honours command, Mark Speakman, Attorney General. And Principal Registrar, do you have the form containing the O's and the Bible upon which they will be taken? Justice Chin, I now ask you to rise and take the oaths of office, first the oath of allegiance and then the judicial oath. I, Nicholas Edward Chin, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. I, Nicholas Edward Chin, do swear that I will well and truly serve our Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth II, in the office of Judge of the Supreme Court of New South Wales, and I will do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of the state of New South Wales without fear or favour, affection or ill will. So help me God. Thank you, Justice Chen. Please resume your seat to subscribe the oaths after which I will attest them. Principal Registrar, I hand to you the oaths to be placed amongst the court's archives and the Bible uh, so that you may have the customary inscription inserted into it in order that it may be presented to Justice Chen as a memento of this occasion. 
Justice Chen, uh, on my own behalf and on behalf of the judges of the court, I congratulate you uh, warmly on your appointment. I welcome you to the court. I remember some years ago now I tried to lure you from the 10th floor to the 11th floor <laughs> unsuccessfully due to the advocacy of the excellent members of that floor. Uh, I am very pleased to see that you have accepted the attorney's uh, invitation to uh, join this court on this occasion and have not been talked out of it. <laughs> by the uh, congratulations, you will be an excellent judge and a, and a wonderful colleague. Thank you, Chief Justice. Mr Attorney. May it please the court, uh, I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, Justice Chen, on behalf of our state and the bar, it's my great pleasure to congratulate you on your appointment as a judge of the Supreme Court. We're joined in court by your wife, Annette, your son, Zachary and Hudson, your mother, Jennifer, your siblings, Felicity and Simon, and your stepbrother, John. Your Honour grew up in, Par in Taramara. Your education began at Warunga Public School. With characteristic modesty, you've described your early schooling as unremarkable and happy. You were a Boy Scout, and some of the things you learnt with them, with the Boy Scouts, have placed you in good stead decades later. Family camping trips formed some of your happiest memories from childhood. You pitched your tent in some beautiful remote places in Queensland, the Northern Territory, and South Australia. Your high school years at Karingai High saw you develop an interest in history and expand your reading. In Year 12, you were voted school captain and decided to study economics. And although you were offered a place for that degree, it didn't sit quite well with you. And you looked around for another area of study that might better suit your aptitude and temperament. You ended up enrolling with the then Solicitor's Admission Board. While you studied at night, during the day you acted as a barrister's clerk, providing administrative and legal support. After your admission as Solicitor in 1992, you joined Spark Helmore. You learnt the basics of industrial law, general liability and professional indemnity from two respected senior civil law practitioners, the late Nick Ma and Michael Snell. After five years at Spark Helmore, you were called to the bar in 1998 and read with Geoffrey Watson SC and Robert Sheldon SC. You took the academic, civil and legal prize for the highest mark in the New South Wales bar exams. You ultimately joined 10th Lord Chambers and from your first day, you managed a busy workload. Your clients have generally been insurers and businesses. You undertook a Master's of Law at the University of Sydney and eventually were awarded a Doctor of Juridical Studies. You took Silk in 2016. In your quiet and self-effacing way, you've suggested you've never shined, but the exact opposite is true. You're renowned for your discipline, your superior time management, your attention to detail, and your extensive knowledge of the law. You're known to start work at 6 a.m. every day. And as one of your juniors noted when she worked with you, you were right across the brief, the witnesses and the day's proceedings before she was even out of bed. <laughs> one of your other colleagues noted waggishly, I don't know where his work ethic comes from, and I certainly hope never to emulate it. <laughs> but that diligence is an ideal attribute for someone on the bench. Indeed it is. Alongside your legal skill, your juniors and instructing solicitors spoke repeatedly of your kindness, your courtesy, and your gentle yet effective way of mentoring and teaching younger solicitors and barristers. You're also known to have an excellent memory for case names and an uncanny ability to rattle off the key authorities and principles in seemingly any area of the common law. This is extremely helpful for your juniors who then know exactly what to look for. This is often accompanied by a cheat sheet that sets out your initial thoughts and forms a template for advice. You have an extraordinary ability to get across the details of a case. You're known to win cases by understanding the details better than anyone else in the courtroom. This allows you to gain the confidence and respect of witnesses. You start off with some background questions that show you're across the details, at which point the witness knows they can't pull one over you. A very handy skill to bring to the bench. Your Honour has been lead counsel or junior counsel assisting ICAC in a number of matters, including operations Eclipse, Skyline, Jasper and Acacia. 
You were the junior counsel in Sweeney and Boylan nominees PDY Limited, where the High Court affirmed that a principal is not vicariously liable for the negligent acts of an independent contractor. That case concerned an injury suffered as a result of negligent repairs to a refrigerator by a contractor. The trial judge found the refrigerator supplier vicariously liable for the negligent repairer. The Court of Appeal reversed this decision. The High Court dismissed the appeal and affirmed the importance of the employee independent contractor distinction in the area of vicarious liability. You were junior counsel in the High Court in Hunter and New England Health District and McKenna. A mentally unwell patient was assessed and involuntarily admitted in a hospital under the Mental Health Act 1990. The next day he was discharged into the care of a friend to be transported to Victoria for treatment in the community. Tragically, the patient killed his friend while they were travelling from New South Wales to Victoria. The relatives of the victim brought proceedings against the local health district, which was responsible for the hospital and doctor that discharged the patient. They alleged that the doctor and hospital were negligent in discharging the patient. The High Court held that the existence of a duty of care to the relatives would not be consistent with the Mental Health Act, essentially because that act imposed an obligation not to detain a patient if the doctor were of the opinion that other care of a less restrictive kind was appropriate and reasonably available to the patient. Performance of that duty was inconsistent with a common law duty that required the doctor to have regard to the interests of those to whom the patient might have come into contact. And in Cyril Smith and Associates and the owner's strata plan 64970, you were junior counsel for the appellant. The court found that where there had been negligent construction of a building, the relevant loss accrues when the defects became manifest or are otherwise discovered. And the cause of actions accrual did not depend on the party seeking damages knowing the cause of the defect and where legal responsibility for it might lie. So these are just a few examples of the vast range of matters that you've handled over three decades. Your Honours courteous and deferential manner are well known in legal circles and among staff in courts and chambers. You're known as a thorough and effective cross-examiner with a distinctive questioning style. You've said one of the things about being a barrister is you must reinvest. You recognise that a barrister must apply time and effort to assist new and upcoming barristers. Younger barristers and lawyers who've worked with you are grateful for your time and knowledge that you share so generously, your patience, and the gentle manner in which you teach and guide them through cases. Three barristers have read with you since you came to the bar. You're also extremely supportive of women barristers, including women who are returning to work after parental leave. One junior remarked on your patience and flexibility when she returned to work after her second baby was born. She juggled the case with a toddler and a four-month-old at home. She stated that the load of the dual roles of mum and barrister were much more manageable due to your understanding and preparedness to work with a new mum. You're a member of the New South Wales Bar Association Common Law Committee and have served as director of the Barristers and Sickness Accident Fund Bar Cover. Outside the courtroom, you're an active runner. You've competed in many fun runs, 25 half marathons and five full marathons. Uh, you've even been impolitic enough to thrash a Minister of the Crown in one of your events. <laughs> you're also a supporter of the Waratahs and the Wallabies and an even more devoted supporter of the Parramatta Eels. You're a big fan of the TV comedy Seinfeld and have been known by colleagues to use a quote from the program where appropriate. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> You're a great family man, devoted to your wife, Annette, and love spending time with your sons, Zachary and Hudson, and you love traveling. Your good nature and quick thinking has had an impact on many people, perhaps none so much as Gary Dickerson, who walked ahead of you on the moving pathway in the domain one morning in 2017. Uh, the moving pathway, so-called, wasn't working that day but Mr. Dickerson and you took it as a stable path through the domain. It was just before 6 a.m. when Mr. Dickerson collapsed in front of you. He'd suffered a cardiac arrest. You'd learned CPR in the Boy Scouts and had earned a bronze medallion from Surf Life Saving Australia, so could perform CPR straight away while someone else called for an ambulance. Mr. Dickerson made a full recovery 
And this happy ending is a result in no small way from your quick thinking and immediate action. Your life-saving actions were acknowledged with a Cardiac Saviour Award by New South Wales Ambulance. You're a gentle, reserved man who specialises in burying his light under the proverbial bushel. Your legal career illustrates great learning and skill, a sterling work ethic, and a determination to treat peers, colleagues, clients, and strangers with respect and kindness. Jerry Seinfeld has made a pertinent comment about lawyers. To me, he says, a lawyer is basically the person who knows the rules of the country. We're all throwing the dice, playing the game, moving our pieces around the board, but if there's a problem, the lawyer is the only person who has read the inside of the top of the box. <laughs> Your Honour, you've read the rules on the lid and have applied them with fairness and ingenuity throughout your career. Today may be the closing chapter, closing of one chapter in your career, but the hard work you've put in over the past decades culminates today with this appointment as your next chapter begins. Congratulations on your appointment to the Supreme Court, and I wish you the very best for your career on the bench. May it please the court. Mr. Attorney. <laughs> Jennifer Bull, Treasurer of the Law Society. May it please the court. I too acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which this court stands and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge and extend my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us here today. I come before the court on behalf of the solicitors of our state to offer congratulations and to wish your honour well in your appointment to the Supreme Court of New South Wales. It's perhaps to the great disadvantage of the solicitor branch of the profession that your honour chose so early in your career to heed the call to the bar. We were very fortunate to have you within our ranks, even if only relatively briefly. Your honour is a famously private person. Famously private people create little scandal. Such hijinks that may have occurred have passed unwitnessed and therefore untold, for the most part. <laughs> Mischief, if it happened at all, swoosh under the radar. The search for colourful stories about Your Honour has been a near impossible task. This speech has the potential to be mightily boring, but I did say only near impossible. But the things that were said about Your Honour in the course of preparing for these remarks have been uniformly positive and universally shared. Your Honour's love of the law was kindled shortly after you left school at 17. Just a few steps from this building, you obtained work as a clerk's assistant in Fort Wentworth. Even then, as Your Honour engaged in the often mundane tasks assigned to you, those who had the pleasure of observing you at close quarters identified even then a young man possessing qualities of intellect, wisdom, and diligence far beyond his years. A few phrases keep coming up when people describe Your Honour, apart from incredibly private person and perhaps astonishingly youthful, <laughs> is always destined for greatness. Your Honour arrayed as you are now in your judicial splendour, greatness may be said to have arrived. Some who find themselves in the position Your Honour does today might be flattered by and even agree with such an observation about themselves. I'm told Your Honour would likely blush furiously at such a suggestion, a reaction that speaks of your innate humility and dedication to the work rather than the trappings. Your Honour was persuaded by those who noticed your attributes at Fort Wentworth to pursue a career in law and off you went to the Solicitor's Admissions Board I don't know if there's an official record time for finishing that punishing course, but legend is that you set it. Your academic brilliance and aptitude for this profession shone again when winning the Academic Civil and Legal Prize for your first in the bar exams before taking up practice in February 1998, still in your mid-twenties. Just one result from what one of your admirers call your really, really good brain. The early encouragement and mentoring you received in those days in Fort Wentworth have had a, must have had a deep impact on Your Honour. 
You have in many ways paid that support forward in the help you have given throughout your career to younger practitioners. Your Honour appears to be a one-man equitable briefing bureau, often requesting, as your juniors, rising female stars of the law. As a member of your floor's readers' committee, you were always keen to nab the brightest of legal talent. At least one of your Honour's previous charges has described you as the Dumbledore or Obi-Wan of your trainee <laughs> wizards or Padawans. You inculcate in your charges the best traditions of the profession. I'm told that none have yet passed to the dark side. Could they mean equity or perhaps the Voldemort list? <laughs> one of the bar's oldest traditions, of course, is the robes. On one occasion when walking a junior back from this building to 10 Wentworth, or the Hogwarts of Philip Street, the junior had decided his wig too great a burden for his young head. <laughs> Firmly, but with empathy, you reminded him of the necessity to either robe completely or not at all. The wig was quickly back in place, public nudity not being a reasonable option in this precinct. <laughs> Similarly, Your Honour did all you could to encourage one instructing solicitor in a hot courtroom to wear his jacket despite the sweltering atmosphere. While compliance on this occasion wasn't as easily won, I'm sure the momentary comfort of having no jacket vanished in the slow boil of your understated disapproval. <laughs> but these are just the visible indicia of a practitioner's courtesy in and duty to the court. Your Honour's character is replete with qualities that have engendered trust, not only from your clients, but also your opponents and the court. The saying goes, if Nick Chen says the evidence will establish these facts, all in hearing can be assured that those facts will be established. As an advocate, Your Honour is described as exceptionally capable. As an officer of this court, dedicated, polite and proper. As an opponent, formidable and fair, but not without a little cheek. There was a lawyer from ground floor Wentworth with a reputation for asking every single one of his opponents as the duel commenced, how are you possibly going to win this? He tried this with Your Honour. Your Honour met your opponent's gaze with a glint in your eye and tapping the chair beside you replied, you come sit next to me and I'll show you. <laughs> I believe you did. Despite Your Honour's youthful appearance, you're described as old school with a continuing affection for the hard copy and a reluctance around emails and all that newfangled stuff like an Excel spreadsheet. This became a bit of an issue during lockdown when some of your colleagues took work home in a laptop or hard drive, the number of documents you needed to transport physically to your home office, I'm told, required a small truck. We have heard this morning of Your Honour's heroic life-saving efforts, an event that should have surprised no one. You are ever observant for those in need of help. Once on a shopping trip, Your Honour noticed a woman in an arm cast and sling, struggling with navigating her bags and trolley to the car. You stepped in to assist her. As you approached her vehicle, the boot popped open. You noticed a man in the driver's seat relaxing and reading what appeared to be a form guide. <laughs> the gentleman was familiar to you, being of senior counsel himself. <laughs> your Honour's demands of yourself through thorough and meticulous attention to detail has led some to observe that you have, how should I put this politely, an attitude often associated with the end of the digestive tract in fact, I'm told some of your previous colleagues when learning of the Attorney General's announcement last month of your ascension to the bench, exclaimed loudly, oh no, this is of no slight, Your Honour, but a compliment. Those practitioners know that appearing before you will require a thorough preparation because they know that you will be prepared. You will have read the pleadings and more and have identified the issues at the heart of the case. As the trial begins, you will know each case put before you better than those putting it. Your encyclopedic knowledge of the cases is legendary. Your Honour has been the torchbearer for a tradition among personal injury counsel when discussing with colleagues a principle or proposition for which there is want of authority to cite that now well-known legal fiction, Phillips 
versus Country Women's Association. <laughs> the knowledge that you will adhere strictly to the rules, call it as you see it, and will not hesitate to call out, albeit courteously, the substandard preparation, and will assure that those who appear before you, that you will apply the law assiduously and fairly. Your Honour is described as a normal man, not a knockabout bloke, but one who has no pomposity or airs. The simple holiday pleasure of a GNT on a balcony is said to have made you as happy as anywhere in the world. You are remarkably fit on occasion recording a sub three hour marathon time. Given the schedule you keep, such stamina is a necessity. Your Honour is habitually at chambers out of before sunrise and home as it sets to spend time with your beloved wife Annette and sons Zachary and Hudson who are here today sharing this important moment with you. Your mother, Jennifer Cockney, is here too, along with your sister Felicity and husband Dan, your stepbrother John Cockney and his wife Trish, and taking the video stream in the US, your brother Simon and wife Susan. It is said you gravitated to the law for all the right reasons and that your integrity is your guide. Your Honour has been described as a model citizen, someone who accompanied you on all those road trips, doing mining cases in the early days had observed he'd never seen you break the speed limit. That in itself is qualification for high judicial office. <laughs> but just such a model citizen is exactly the type of person who should occupy the bench. To reach judicial office in this court can rightly be thought of as a pinnacle achievement for a lawyer. But this appointment isn't the end of the journey for your honour. You will be scrupulous in your new role, dedicated to upholding the rule of law, and in doing so, reward the public's confidence in our system of justice. Your Honour can be expected to treat your new duties, as once stated by Peter Sellers, as subjects of the gravest responsibility and shall ever continue to do so. As you find in matters before you, the exact, literal and absolute truth as to the state of the case. Never forgetting, of course, the eternal question, but what about the workers? Those who are familiar with your honour would know that this ceremony is very much not what you are about. That you are always careful never to make yourself the centre of attention, always calm, polite and proper. Your honour is known to barely curse at all. You did so once, just before plummeting to the earth from a perfectly good aircraft. You did have a parachute, which fortunately for us all appears to have worked. Your honour, congratulations on your appointment. The solicitors of the state look forward to many years of relief knowing that at last the other side won't have briefed you against them. <laughs> we wish you great success as a justice of this honourable court. As the court pleases. Justice Chairman. Your Excellency the Governor, Chief Justice, Attorney General, fellow judges, colleagues, friends and family. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we gather today, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you, Attorney General and Ms Ball for your most kind and generous words. I do admit to being a reasonably early starter, a habit that developed partly out of the need to find more time in the day to get everything done, and partly because I was trying to emulate the efficiency of Justice Dark, another early starter who was then on my old floor. Otherwise, I'm afraid to say that my story is rather more low level. Let me begin. When I was a young boy, as my mother occasionally reminds me, all I wanted to be was a garbage man. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, according to my mother, I was quite taken by the idea of standing on the back of the truck as it whizzed down the streets, which was all I needed to solidify my career choice. <laughs> That piece of trivia has, despite my best creative efforts, or perhaps it is due to my lack of creativity, no other connection to what follows. <laughs> Except perhaps to say to my dear mother that, by this appointment, you can now rest easy in the knowledge that that career path has now passed me by. <laughs> my first connection to the law was working in chambers on Fort Wentworth in a position which I'm going to spice up a little. <laughs> document reproduction officer. <laughs> the job was once described as a chamber slave. That is not inaccurate. But I enjoyed the job and have only fond memories of it and the people on the floor. 
many of whom I'm still in contact with. I remember that the weekly pay was $110, and I studied part-time through the SAB course doing this job. After about a year and a half or so, I began working for just a few of the barristers on that floor, including Anna Katzman, now Justice Katzman of the Federal Court, Alan Cooley and Terry Rolls. They were good times, and I very much enjoyed working for them. I'm honoured by the presence of Justice Katzman here today. It was at this point that I was given the opportunity to accelerate my studies. I realised that I would benefit from some additional tuition if I was to do so. To say that Lady Luck delivered in spades is an understatement. I was introduced to Jane Jago, now a judge of the Federal Court. Jane more or less taught me the law, from torts to public international law and everything in between. I cannot really put into words how influential Jane has been to my career. Everything I've achieved as a solicitor and later as a barrister and the opportunities that I had to study further can be traced to the habits, disciplines and methods she shared with me. Jane also encouraged me to study further and I've done that. To Jane, thank you and I hope there is a sense of pride and fulfilment in how you shaped a teenager into a judge. I'm deeply honoured by your presence here today. Before I went to the bar, I worked as a solicitor at Spark Hillmore. It was then known as Spark Hillmore and Withigam. My time at Spark Hillmore was an incredibly positive one. They had good leaders and good people working for them. They still do. Many of the people that I work with at Sparks are still there and a good number of them have recently been in touch to wish me well. I was at Sparks for five years. I think I can describe my practice as being a fairly traditional common law one. I did workers' compensation for a short while and then moved into general common law, industrial accident, public liability and professional indemnity. I did some other things, general contracts, some industrial and employment, but that is what I basically did. The work was high volume but extremely enjoyable. It taught me many of the fundamentals, a good understanding of practice and procedure and the discipline necessary to manage a large file load. A considerable proportion of the cases I had ran to hearing and it exposed me to courts and barristers. As a solicitor, I had the very good fortune to brief many outstanding senior counsel and leaders of the common law bar, including Christopher G QC, Robert Stitt QC, John Timms QC and John Hislop QC, to name just some, and a range of excellent juniors, including Mark Williams, now a judge of the district court, Anthony Bartley, Geoffrey Watson and Nick Poland. It was always in my mind to go to the bar, but I did not have a set date that I would go. <coughs> However, I remember one day talking to Geoffrey Watson and he more or less said, you should come now, you are ready. I'm not sure to this day whether he thought I would act on that advice, but I did. <laughs> so I enrolled to sit the bar exams and fortunately passed. So the time came to tell the managing partner of the firm that I was leaving and going to the bar. The managing partner of the firm at the time was the late Nick Ma, who was a terrific fellow. So confident of I, so confident was I of my success as a barrister that when I told Nick I was going to the bar, I asked him whether, if things did not work out, it would be possible for me to have my job back. <laughs> <laughs> he assured me that there would always be a job for me in the mail room. <laughs> Buoyed by the knowledge that I was held in such high regard by Nick, <laughs> off I went to the bar in 1998. When I came to the bar, I read with Geoffrey Watson and Robert Sheldon. I could not have asked for better tutors and the friendship and support that they have given me during the whole of my time at the bar, I hold very dear. They have always made themselves available to me at any time of the day, and I'm incredibly grateful for their guidance, wisdom and good humour. Thank you both for all you have done for me. My time at the bar has been marked by the willingness of its more senior members to help me. I will mention a number, but I would like to briefly speak about two, the Honourable John Hislop QC, a former judge of this court, and John McConaughey QC. When I was a solicitor and when I came to the bar, John Hislop QC was the dominant common law appellate silk. John was an outstanding advocate. His written work was concise and to the point. His court craft may be similarly described he was extremely thorough. He, understand, he understandably commanded significant respect. I've not counted, but I suspect that I was junior to John in around 20 or so appeals before he was appointed in 2004. For junior counsel, preparing written submissions for senior counsel can sometimes be quite daunting. 
With John, I must concede that many, in reality probably all, of my first drafts were amended, I'll put it politely, by way of significant contraction. <laughs> but eventually, as time went on, taking on more of John's style, first drafts would be amended slightly and occasionally by no amendment. John has had a significant influence on my career. He was unfailingly kind to me and taught me a great deal. I know that John is watching online and I'm very much honoured by that. If, as an advocate, John Hislop QC could be described as measured and a few words, he was very much more, of course. John McConaughey, as many as you would know, is a man of many words. <laughs> John, or Macca, as he is affectionately known, was extremely kind and generous with his time. And we've done a considerable number of cases, both trials and appeals, together. John helped me enormously. Thank you for coming along to share this day with me, John, and thank you for all you have done for me. John's talented son, Mark, read with me, and no doubt because of his father's strong influence and mine, he's eschewed common law work entirely. <laughs> Mark, you are always welcome back. I would also like to mention and to thank Larry King, SC, Julian Sexton, SC, Trish McDonald, SC, and Nick Poland, SC, for their unwavering support and friendship. Life as a barrister is nothing without solicitors to support you. I've been very well looked after by a range of solicitors, but there is a small cohort who have more or less supported me from when I first started at the bar, or for a very substantial part of it. So to Nerily Martin, John Vanderpol, Joe Vesper and Brian Moroni, thank you very much. To each of you, it has been a great pleasure losing your cases over a long period of time. <laughs> I was very fortunate to be able to undertake a doctoral degree and have the supervision of Professor Mary Croc and Professor Margaret Allars SC, two of Australia's leading public law academics and, in the case of Margaret, one of Australia's leading public law counsel. The journey to complete a thesis is alleged to be a rewarding one. To me, it was like having to put down your own dog, not that I've ever had to do that. <laughs> to fit the research and writing around work and family was a challenge. Margaret was instrumental in me completing my thesis. Over the course of years, every three months or so, I would submit a chapter. Margaret would take the time to review it, scribbling notes that eventually I was able to decipher. We would meet and discuss what I had done. Margaret's knowledge of administrative and public law is formidable. So the reality was that I was just listening. And so it took shape. I know that Margaret was not able to be here today, but I wish to acknowledge the role she had and the bond that we share. Taking silk was particularly rewarding. For me, the very real benefit of taking silk was it enabled me to work consistently with a number of outstanding junior counsel. I've been lucky to work with a good number, but I would like to particularly acknowledge four of them whom I've worked with extensively. Juliet Curtin, Naomi Oreb, Dean Stretton and James Lee. Each of them were a pleasure to work with. They all share similar characteristics. They are incredibly hardworking, exceptional at what they do and genuinely nice people. They are all future leaders of the bar. It is often said that commonly junior counsel makes senior counsel look good. I can honestly say that for each of them, they make me look good. I've been on three floors whilst at the bar, the fourth floor of Wentworth Chambers, or the Fighting Fourth as they like to be known, and the 11th and 10th floor of Wentworth Chambers, or the Fighting Tenth as they like to be known. <laughs> I spent around 15 years on the 10th floor, so forgive me if I focus upon my time there. The floor had, during my time, two fabulous clerks, Di Strathdee and Emma Houlihan, both of whom are here today. For my part, a barrister's practice is only as good as their clerk, and with Di and Emma, I was fortunate to have two of the best. They did a sterling job in managing me and I have great affection for them both. Their job is made easier by the people that help them and to the wonderful staff on 10, Judy, Phoebe, Ash, Zoe and Jason, thank you for all your help and good cheer. To my dear colleagues on the 10th floor, I cannot think of a better group of people to have shared chambers with or a better place to work. You've been great friends and I have enjoyed our interactions immensely. I've been quite overwhelmed and touched by the messages of support that I've received by colleagues and friends, by judges and former judges. Some were quite funny, and I will not mention what they said. Some were envious, one of which said, I hope you're enjoying that moment of returning every unattractive brief in chambers. <laughs> the answer, James Scheller, is, <laughs> yes, I did enjoy that. <laughs> 
some offered practical advice such as, quote, in the first few days of your new role, just remember you don't have to object to questions. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy Morris, for that very helpful reminder. I'm going to adopt Justice Yahir's practice of putting a post-it note on the bench with that very statement. I've left my family to the end, but they are the most important. To my cousins, Lyndon and Catherine Jukes, and their girls, Alice and Lucy, thank you for making this a whole family experience. To Felicity, Simon and John, thank you for sharing today with me. I could not have asked for better siblings. You've always looked after your younger brother and you still look after me to this day. I'm very proud of you and all you have achieved, particularly you, John, for being the first to be able to retire. I'm very <laughs> impressed. <laughs> I, on the other hand, have a long way to go. <laughs> to my dear mum, thank you for all that you've given me and our family. You've shaped the person who I am. We were brought up in a no-fuss household. Work hard, be grateful for what you have, be kind to others and do your best. We are blessed to have you in our lives. To my wife, Annette, without your love and support, none of this would be possible. I'm blessed to have you in my life. Today is as much for you as it is for me except you don't have to write any judgments. <laughs> to our beautiful boys, Zachary and Hudson, you give mum and I immense joy and happiness and you are developing into upstanding young men. We are very proud of you. My family and I live an uncomplicated life and the rules are fairly clear. I serve them. <laughs> For me, the Chen household experience, I can only liken to having a court of appeal above me, except that decisions of mine can be and are overturned without demonstration of error or of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> and reasons are not required. <laughs> Thank you to the Chief Justice and to the Chief Judge of the Common Law Division, Justice Beach Jones, for showing confidence in me and making me feel so welcome. And to Justice Beach Jones for revealing your good humour early. I now know from my hearing allocation that my first trial is not, as you first mentioned me some weeks ago, a four-week murder trial. <laughs> to the judges of the court, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for the warmth and generosity that you have shown me already. I'm privileged to be your colleague. It is an indescribably great honour to be able to serve on this court. Tadashi Yanai once said this, I'm never really satisfied with anything because the world is ever changing. If you keep climbing up, then you see another higher mountain. You climb up that peak and see another. I will pass away eventually because that is life, but I am climbing mountains because I enjoy the process of climbing a mountain. That quote goes reasonably close to capturing a big part of me. I will keep climbing, hopefully with some success, but I can say that, so far, the view looks pretty good. We have a saying in our household, work hard and do your best. I say it to my children every night before they go to bed. As a judge, I will work hard and do my best. Thank you very much for coming along today and sharing this experience with me and the court. Chief Justice. Court will now adjourn. All stand. This honourable court is now adjourned. God save the Queen. Yeah.